Paul is summarizing his uh, discussion of a very important issue, the place of uh, Jewish distinctives in the church. He basically rules out any room for any kind of distinctions for one simple reason, and then he gives another. The first simple reason is that in Christ, there's neither male or female, Jew or Gentile, bond or free. So we cannot and ought not draw distinctions. We're one in Christ. The second reason is even more important and is the root of the first. And that is to draw a distinction while we are united in Christ is to say that there's something more important than he who unites us. In other words, it's to put Christ in a secondary position. And that is an option Paul with great vehemence is not willing to consider. Rather, he says, may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And then he explains what he means. For neither is circumcision anything, that's being Jewish or maintaining Jewish custom, nor uncircumcision, that's being a Delawarean or a Marylandian or just a simple American. For neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision the only thing that counts, he says, is a new creation, God's saving work in our hearts and lives. And, he says, those who will walk by this rule, by the principle that Jesus and his work is first and nothing else really matters, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. So. That is why I do not describe myself as a Messianic Jew, for example, but as a Jewish Christian. In fact, uh, the church that I was privileged to pastor in Israel wasn't even a Jewish Christian church. It was a Christian church. We strongly believed, as I strongly believe to this day, that the only thing that should characterize us as a church is Jesus. Our faith in Him, our hope in Him, our reliance upon Him for our salvation, for our sanctification, for our glorification. Church is all about God as He is known in Jesus Christ. And that is what we endeavor to emphasize both in the name we chose ourselves, Grace and Truth Christian Congregation, and in the way we try to conduct our church life. As a result of that, one of the features of which I was most particularly happy uh, was the fact that we had not only Israelis, but we had Israelis and uh, Arab Palestinians amongst us worshiping together. Because you see, when you when you put a Jewish distinctive forward, for example, then you're also implying a few other things. Because our nation is in conflict with the Arab Palestinians, we're basically saying, amongst other things, that we identify with a certain political struggle. But we don't. Not as Christians. Those of us who are Israeli and Jewish would naturally uh, have uh, Israel and the Jewish people's interests closest at heart. But we do not think it is not Christian to be a Palestinian or to hold the interests and concerns of the Palestinian people at heart. And we also recognize the fact that our interests as Jews and their interests as Palestinians conflict one with another. But their interests as Christians and our interests as Christians are exactly the same. And it is Christ who unites us. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Israel and the Jewish Christian scene there, a little bit about the uh, Arab Christian scene, of which I know much less. 
tell you a little bit about uh, the work in which uh, I've been involved over the years, and then we'll hand over to you, presuming there will be time for questions. Israel has a population of about seven and a half million. About a million and a half of those are Arabs. Arab Israelis living in the land, most of them are Muslim. Some 350,000 of them uh, are uh, Christians of various description, particularly Roman Catholic and Greek Orthodox. The evangelical community amongst the Arabs is somewhere in the vicinity of 1500. So they're not a large uh, minority. Uh, within their own people, they would be about a third. And within uh, that group, you have a very small group of evangelical Christians. Most of the uh, churches amongst the Arabs are Baptist. At least the evangelical churches would be Baptist. Plymouth Brethren, which is a denomination founded in, in England. Uh, it's rare to find a Plymouth Brethren church here in the United States. And Pentecostal. In fact, Pentecostalism is the de facto um, a guiding principle of most of the churches amongst the Arabs, as it is amongst the Jews. Among the Jewish Christians, there are somewhere between 10 to 12,000 Jewish Christians in the country, including their children and spouses, and of course, not all of their spouses are Christians, and not all of their children are Christians, or at least not Christians yet. Hopefully, in the kindness and mercy of God, some will be converted and their numbers will grow. I was converted to Israel uh, to Christ in 1963 while serving in the uh, Israeli army. Everyone uh, in Israel does mandatory service, so serving in the army is no, no big thing. My wife served in the army, my daughters served in the army, everybody serves in the army. It's, it's just the way of life. We are engaged in a, in a struggle for our very existence, we're surrounded by uh, Muslim Arab nations that are determined to destroy us if they possibly can. So we have to enlist every resource we have, human and otherwise, in order to protect ourselves. So we all serve in the army. Now to give you a sense of the growth of the church over these years, as I said, I was converted in 63, towards the end of 63, November 1963. At that time, there were not more than two to three hundred Jewish Christians in the whole of the country. So the, the church has grown, numerically at least. It has is, is really grown and it continues to grow. Some of the growth has been the product of evangelism. Some of it has been the product of the immigration of Christians, Jewish Christians, into Israel. Primarily from the former Soviet Union, but not exclusively from Soviet. There are about 150 Hebrew-speaking congregations in the country. Uh, another 10 or so Amharic-speaking congregations. Amharic is the language spoken in Ethiopia. And uh, the Ethiopian Jews are the, are the children, the descendants, of those Jews who fled at the destruction of the first temple, fled the Babylonian uh, forces into Egypt, and then from Egypt down to Ethiopia, because Babylon conquered Egypt as well. So that, as far as they were concerned for many years, time stood still. They know nothing of anything that occurred after the destruction of the temple, the first temple. So that Ezra and Nehemiah, Esther, Daniel, um, Malachi, Zechariah, Haggai, uh, these are all unknown to them. They were cut off for a long, long time and developed something of their own distinct Jewish culture, very different from uh, the Jewish culture, culture that was developed in Europe or elsewhere in the Arabian Peninsula. 
There are also somewhere between 30 to 50 Russian-speaking churches and house fellowships that uh, gather around the country. Some of these come into being and disappear overnight. Some of them develop and ultimately become churches. But the majority of Russian-speaking Christians from the former Soviet Union who immigrated to Israel had joined themselves to local Hebrew-speaking congregations. So that uh, you will find anywhere between 50 to 90 percent uh, of the congregants in a Hebrew-speaking church are actually Russian speakers or formerly Russian speakers and their children. In our congregation, for example, uh, where my wife and I worship, uh, I having completed my term of service as pastor of a church, uh, there are about a hundred congregants and uh, 80 of them at least never counted them exactly, but give you a, an informed guesstimate, at least 80 of them are former Russian speakers. Now there is a growing number of young people, their children who have grown up in Israel, who speak Hebrew, and are beginning to make something of a mark on Israeli society. I served as the pastor of Grace and Truth Christian Congregation from its founding, 1976 until I completed my term of service in December 2008. I had initiated a clause in the Constitution which said that at the age of 65 the pastor was to resign his post. I did this because I had seen both churches and Christian organizations that were led by people who, in the course of time, did not recognize the fact that their powers were waning. Let, let me give you an example. I'm sure you've heard of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He had a close friend called John Cager. John Cager was the pastor of Gunsbury Baptist Church in London, Chiswick, London. John was a marvelous man of God and a superb preacher. In fact, when Lloyd-Jones wasn't preaching himself, John would be the person he'd go to listen to. And I remember Gunsbury Baptist Church. I was ordained to the Gospel Ministry by John Cager. And I remember Gunsbury Baptist Church where in cold London winters, not only would the church be packed, but people would be standing outside with the windows open so they could hear his, him preach, hear his sermons. But as happens to some of us, John grew old. And uh, with age, his powers began waning. I visited the church some years back. There were barely a dozen left. But they loved John. And no one had the heart to say to him, John, it's time to step down and make room for someone else. So I was pretty determined that I would not do that to the church that I love. So I had the clause written into the Constitution and uh, as I neared the age of 65, I reminded the church of that clause and uh, initiated a search a process to find someone who would take my place as the pastor. Meanwhile, the church uh, continued to grow. We, uh, at one stage, were uh, about 450. Had five elders working with me. There were five deacons and there were three evangelists. We also had uh, work amongst the deaf, and uh, at least two of your pews would be full of people from the deaf community who would come and sit at the front row and have the sermon, uh, actually the whole proceedings translated for them into sign language. When they first came, it was quite a challenge because the first couple or two that came, we had no one uh, who could translate for them. And so 
as I was preaching, I learned, uh, I learned sign language. Now, it's interesting because the sign language I learned was Russian sign language, and I, don't, I can't speak Russian. But I could use a, a Hebrew word in my mind and use the Russian sign. That would be no problem. I won't say that I was very um, fluent in Russian sign language, but it was the best that I could do. Now, as staid as I am in the pulpit nowadays because of my uh, enroaching age, um, I was rather energetic in the pulpit in those days. And the congregation started complaining because not only would I be preaching, but I would also be signing at the same time. Well, it was the sacrifice they needed to make for the sake of the death. Until God, in His kindness and His mercy, to our great surprise, brought a professional Russian signer, a Christian, into the congregation. And of course, she immediately took over the task and began signing for them. And that was really how our work amongst the deaf began. It was quite a providential act of God, the fact that this couple came and the fact that this translator came. In between, before I had learned something of sign language and uh, when these people came, what we would do is we would have people uh, who spoke Russian and understood Hebrew uh, sit beside them and as I would preach, they would transcribe the sermon into Russian so that the deaf were always three or four steps behind us by the time they transcribed and passed it on to them to read and then by the time they read it, but at least they were able to follow what was going on. When the Russians came, we were faced with a rather fascinating challenge. You see, our faith had been formulated in Israel and naturally took on the cultural overtones of uh, our culture. But the Russians had a different Christian culture, and theirs was at least as legitimate as ours. Now, obviously, if we want to speak into the Israeli people, if we want to address our own nation, we'll have to do it in their cultural terms. But does, does that mean that we disenfranchise the Russian speakers? No. So we were faced with a situation in which we had to make very significant cultural compromises. It meant, for example, that as I would preach, the sermon would be translated into, simultaneously into Russian. It meant, for example, that uh, we couldn't use a hymn book, we used the screen, and we would have there both uh, Hebrew, English for the unlearned, and the Russian on the screen so that people could sing with us. But can you imagine singing any kind of a Christian hymn in three languages at the same time? It was, it was, it was the Tower of Babel reversed. It was wonderful. It was sometimes difficult. They were used to a different lilt. They put their emphases slightly differently. Uh, sometimes their tempo was a bit different. But over the course of time, we learn to accommodate one another. And uh, the more the Russian newcomers uh, settled in the land, the more comfortable they became with uh, uh, Israeli Christian culture. And so a great deal of the, of the grounds that we lost at the beginning, we slowly regained without uh, any premeditation until a certain point where we decided, well, it was time. And so then there was a measure of premeditation involved. In addition to my work as the pastor of the church, I had the privilege of serving with a Christian missionary society, originally founded by Andrew Bonar and Robert Mary McShane, if those names ring a bell with you. Uh, our, our Missionary Society was founded in uh, 1844, one of the first missionary societies to the Jewish people. Uh, and they had a work in Israel since 1924. 
Okay. I was not with the work all those years. I joined the work in 1974, another four. CWI believed that the most substantial contribution it could make to the evangelization of the Jewish people and of the Arab people in Israel would be through the local church. And therefore, premeditatedly, rather than engaging as a mission in evangelism, we engaged as a mission in trying to build up the church, primarily by means of Christian literature. That meant that uh, most of my time, and as the staff grew, most of the time of the staff was devoted to the translation, uh, editing, uh, typesetting, layout, and printing of Christian literature in Hebrew. The first book that I ever worked on was Francis Schaeffer's The God Who Is There. It was an unwise choice because Francis Schaefer, Schaefer has his own way with language. He often transgresses every grammatical rule you can imagine and uses words, English words, in ostensibly a non-English manner. But that was the first book that I worked on and uh, when I look back now on that book, I'm embarrassed. I, I would do a much better job today, I hope, than I, would, uh, than I was able to do then. Forty years almost have passed, and I've learned a few tricks over the course of time. But uh, we produced a plethora of books, both uh, explaining the Bible and explaining the Christian faith. We were not interested in how-to books. How to find the spouse, how to be happy, how to cope with anger, how to whatever. I frankly don't believe in those kind of books, unless it's how to get your computer running, uh, and that book hasn't helped me much. It is my own conviction, you can fault me for it if you wish, but it is my conviction, that when Christians are equipped to understand the truths of the Word of God, and when they are able to formulate those truths in a consistent manner with one part of truth relating to another part of truth, they can draw their own conclusions. And that one does not need to set oneself up as a pope giving practical instructions on how people should conduct their lives. And so my preaching has always partaken of that. And I'm afraid you're going to be exposed to it uh, later on this morning. I believe that our main task is to explain God's Word and to do it in such a manner that people can say, oh, I see the point. And I can go back to that text or using the same principles to any other text and come to an understanding of the Bible. I believe that preachers should equip their congregation to be independent thinkers. And that means that, well, it means that we need to be open to be questioned, to be challenged, to be disagreed with, and to sometimes be shown to be wrong. Now, it hasn't, hasn't happened all too often with me. Well, actually, it has. I surrounded myself with a, a body of elders I won't say they were opinionated, that would be an overstatement. I was probably the only opinionated one among them. But they were strong men with strong minds, they were no yes men, they were no pushovers. And I cannot tell you how many times I lost a vote at the elders' board and was grateful for it later. Now this created a problem because when I completed my term of service and we looked around, the natural place to look first is amongst your own eldership. And we had a young man amongst us, a very dear, fine brother, who had actually had theological education. He had gone to Westminster in Escondido, California. He had graduated well and he was back amongst us. And so the natural thought was that this brother, David, 
he would be the next pastor. Well, the search committee was composed of the elders and three members, three lay members of the congregation. And uh, David's candidacy was turned down for one simple reason. Both the elders and the other members of the search committee said, our eldership is made up of, I won't say untamed horses, but certainly rather, rather, uh, shall I say, horses that need a firm rider. And David's too sweet, too gentle. He's not the kind of person who will bang on the table and say no, even when it needs to be said. Or, Eitan, sit down, shut up, and let someone else talk to him. He's just not that kind of a fellow. And the elders recognized that that's the kind of fellow they needed to lead them. What that says about me, I'll let you conclude for yourselves. Well, I resigned my post as uh, pastor of Grace and Truth in December 28, uh, sorry, uh, 2008. And in order to make elbow room for the new pastor who would come and for the elders, uh, my wife and I removed to another congregation, a doctor congregation, the pastor of which is in fact uh, was an elder uh, of mine before we sent him out to establish the church. He had come to the doctrines of grace under my ministry and uh, now he's my pastor. Grace and Truth was desperate to find someone to lead them. And, uh, well, they made a bad choice. They called someone to the pastorate who was in many, many ways a misfit. I believed, uh, and the church believed with me, that there should be a division of responsibility between the deacons and the elders. And so the deacons were responsible for all the financial, all the administrative, all the organizational aspects of the life of the church under the oversight of the elders. And the elders were responsible for the moral and uh, doctrinal uh, life of the church, we say the moral and the spiritual life of the church. Uh, the pastor who came basically dismissed the deacons and left them with nothing more to do than clean the floor and open the, the church doors in the morning and close them later when the service was over. And he, uh, unlike my practice, which was to preach every other week, and those of the elders who could preach, not all of whom could, but those who could were invited to participate in the pulpit ministry. My, my purpose was to train people, to equip them, and to use every body gift that the Lord had given us. He forbade anyone else to preach but himself, except when he had gone on vacation. More than that, the church shifted its theological grounds. If before it was Reformed and Baptist, uh, in a short while everybody was shifting and looking for some kind of a direction. Well, I can't tell you how I felt. I was the founding pastor of this church. I had served the church for 33 years. I knew these people. I loved them. I still love them. I miss them terribly. And I miss the pastor. I must have been. And here was this fellow mishandling folk in the congregation, mishandling the congregation, shifting the congregation off its doctrinal moorings. What was I to do? Well, the answer is nothing. It's not my church, it's the Lord's. I had resigned my post. I had no authority. I had resigned my membership in the church and removed to another. I had no place and there was, it would be improper for me to intervene in any way but prayer. And pray I did. Retirement has been a, a learning experience for me. It still is. Some folks say that you can't teach uh, an old dog new tricks. Well, 
this soul dog is still learning some new tricks. And I'm learning amongst other things, I hope I'm learning, I think I'm learning, to follow. I was used to uh, be the first among equals. Now I'm, I'm just a congregant, an active congregant. I preach almost every other week uh, for the church. I'm working with the young adults. Sounds to me like a oxymoron. An old man my age working uh, with young adults. But at the moment there's no one else to do it and so, uh, and I enjoy it. I mean, I love, I love their, their challenges, I love their questions. I love their hunger for God's Word. Um, I'm delighted to work amongst them, and I'm, I probably feel uh, at least six months younger when I'm with them. Uh, but it is really uh, something of which I'd be happy to be relieved if the Lord would bring someone else who could not only teach them, but do with them the things that young adults like to do. I, I can't go on an extensive hike with them. I can't uh, camp out as long as they do. There are a lot of things that they would want to do as young people that I can't do anymore. Both because of my age and because of uh, my uh, four-legged position. And so, that's one of the things that I'm praying for, that the Lord would be pleased to bring someone else to take uh, that post. Most of my time at the moment is given to the writing of Christian literature in Hebrew. Some of my books have been translated into English. One of them is on the book table there, a commentary, a devotional commentary on the book of Malachi. Uh, the booklets are free, the uh, uh, bookmarkers are free. I I'm sorry, but the book does cost money and my wife would be delighted to relieve you of any extra cash that you might have with it's fourteen dollars a book. I'm presently engaged in uh, I, what I hope will be the far end of my work on a commentary on Romans, which will probably be the most important piece of literature that I will have written in Hebrew. Now, you need to understand that there is a tremendous lack of Christian literature in Hebrew. There are very few books. Hardly any commentaries. Most of the books of the Bible have not a single commentary in Hebrew. Or the only one they have is the poor one that I was able to write. There are, there's no theological literature about what I've been able to produce. So, our children, our three daughters, their spouses and children, all live here in the States. And if there's anything I pine for, it's to be with them. But I can't. I can't because I need to be in Israel writing in Hebrew for the congregations of the country. Uh, and that is what I'm uh, endeavoring to do. And I'd be grateful for your prayers uh, in this respect as well. One more thing, and I'll hand over to you. Um, I'm also engaged in the last throes of translating the, the Bible, the Old Testament, into modern Hebrew. Of course, uh, the Old Testament is in Hebrew, but it's in ancient Hebrew. Uh, young folk find it difficult to read King James nowadays. Uh, King James was only about 450 years ago, 400 years ago. But we're talking about a language that is between four to two thousand years ago. And so, it's not understandable to the average Israel. So we are producing a modern Hebrew translation of the Bible. Uh, we are just at the end of the work on the Old Testament. I have a few pages yet to edit and send them back. Uh, and then uh, the final volume, the fifth volume of our Old Testament translation will be produced. And then we'll go on into uh, to the new so that we have full Bible in the same level of, uh, of Hebrew. This is an extremely worthwhile project. To be honest, while as I look back on life, 
I'm grateful for the many opportunities that God has given me to serve Him in, in various fascinating, challenging and very honorable contexts, far more than I deserve. If, if this translation was the only thing that I was allowed to do, it would be worth living and dying for. It's so important to have the Word of God in a language that people can understand. So I think that's enough or more than enough by way of a monologue. Uh, if you have questions, I'll be happy to try to answer, but I do have a request. Please do not ask me about other organizations or about individuals working among the Jews. Those are the kind of questions I do not answer. It's over to you. Well then, it's over. Thank you very much.